God is a good thing all the time. But there is this tradition in the church that's gone through ages where people love to stand to hear the word of God. And so we're not gonna put the words on the screen and I'd invite you not to open your Bibles quite yet, but will you stand together as I read this morning from the word of God? I'll be reading out of Luke chapter three, verses 21 and 22. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. So Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it brings. Thank you for the way that it speaks into our life. And Lord, we praise you for who you are. Lord, thank you for who you say that we are. Thank you for the truths that you tell us in this word about who we are. And Lord, thank you so much for the goodness and love that you show us each and every day. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. So I've got a simple question for you. Who are you, right? I know some of you are busting into the song. What is that from CSI? Who are you? Who, 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 who? All right, I like it. There were a couple of people saying with me. Thank you. Appreciate that. But who are you? All right, and, and my guess is, is that if you, if you thought about it and you didn't just say, okay, that's a rhetorical question, but you actually answered the question in your mind, who are you? It started off with something uh, along the lines of what you do. You might've said something like, I'm a husband or a wife. I'm a father or I'm a mother. I do this job. I make this money. I have these degrees. I I go to this school, whatever it might be. I'm on this team, whatever it might be. Who are you? Now, I know that that's a question that it seems like as adults, we usually are supposed to have figured out. But most of the time, if you remember way back to when you were in middle school, junior high for some of us, you remember that that's when you started to ask the question, who am I? Because up until that point, you'd been pretty much told by your parents who you were. You kind of just went through the motions and everything. But then you get to middle school and all of a sudden you start to ask the question, who am I? And you go through this little identity crisis. This past week, uh, uh, I mentioned that I'm the next generation pastor, which means I lead our youth ministry here. It's called Rev. And this last week, we actually partnered with a youth ministry across the street at Life Church called Switch. We did a three night event. And in Wednesday, Wednesday night, there were 352 kids in this room. And right? Yeah, right? They could all be on summer break on vacations, and they rolled in here and they were worshiping Jesus with all their might. Man, it was awesome. But I, the message that I, I preached on Wednesday night was called Identity Theft. So today is Identity Crisis. I'm, like I said, I'm a one trick pony. I got like one thing. We're going to talk about identity, right? But here's the thing that the question that I asked them was, Who are you, right? But the, the, the thing that I wanted them to understand is that comparison steals our identity from us. I'm going to say that again. Comparison steals our identity from us. And, and we know this, right? Especially with teenagers, we see the, the culture that it is today. Man, they are under attack. They are in it. They are battling it. Social media, man, just tells them all sorts of things. They're constantly comparing themselves first to their friends, then what the social media to influencers. I, I helped them, remi- I reminded them that the top 1% of influencers that most of them follow or want to be like, they post about 1%, so they're, they're patterning their life on 1% of the 1%. This is, this is what's going on in our generation, and so it's so easy to go, man, look at them, man, they are struggling with identity, they're struggling with authority, man, this generation, I tell you what, man, they are just battling, there's just, there's nothing, they have no work ethic, they're the snowflake generation, all that kind of stuff. Hold up. Y'all remember being there? In middle school, in high school? maybe even in college. And then after you graduated college and you ask yourself, man, what am I gonna do now? Some of you are there right now. You're like, preach. But wait, and then you get into your 20s and then you get into your 30s and then you get into your 40s and in your 40s, all of a sudden what hits you? That midlife crisis. See, the reality is, is that most of us spend most of our lives asking the question, who am I? And most of the time we define who we are by what we do. 
It's easy for us to do, and by the way, it's the culture that we live in, right? Everything, we want to be bigger, better, faster, stronger. How do we do, how do we elevate? How do we ascend? How do we ascend? But here's the amazing thing. In the gospel, while all of us are trying to ascend in promotion, I need to get a promotion, I need to, gra- or I need to graduate, I need to get a promotion, I need to get a better job, I need to get to retirement. Ascending is everything that we do, but Jesus' model is to descend. Jesus leaves heaven to come to earth. Not to be served, but to serve. And he doesn't consider himself as as being greater, but instead he actually humbles himself to the point of death on a cross. Jesus' whole life is marked by descending. And because as he descends, what ends up happening is he is ascended to the right hand of God. But for most of us, man, we find our identity in what we do. And today, man, I want to contend That God doesn't want us to do so that we'll receive, but rather he wants us to receive so that we can go and do. And and, and so here's here's the thing. Uh, We're gonna get into the word of God. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter three, verse 21. And while you're going there, I'm just gonna take a second. I'm gonna get us kind of up to speed on things. There's this guy named John the Baptist. Somebody say John the Baptist. By the way, just in case you didn't know, you are allowed to talk in church today. If you like something that I say, you can say, yes, good, woohoo, right? If you don't like something I say, go ahead and boo me. It's, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, let's, let, let's test this out. I love the Creighton Blue Jays. Well, okay, I, some of you could have said, yeah. Like, it was like a mix there, I kind of hoped, man. Like, whoa, all right, cool, 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 cool. Y'all are a hater. bunch of Creighton haters in here, okay. A lot of booze. Okay. All right. Moving on. There's this guy named John the Baptist. Somebody say John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, uh, man, he was preparing the way. I don't know if you know this, but John the Baptist and Jesus were actually relatives. John the Baptist's mom was Elizabeth. She was a relative of Mary, who was Jesus's mom. They were relatives, but they didn't necessarily know each other really well uh, growing up because we don't know a lot about Jesus for the first 30 years of his life. Meanwhile, John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's preaching the word, man. But he is, a, he is what most of us would look at and just kind of shy away from. He dresses like a bit of a crazy person. He eats, he eats locusts and honey, right? And he's out there telling everybody to repent and be baptized, to repent and to be baptized. At one particular point, he actually refers to the religious leaders of the time as snake babies. You know, John the Baptist, he doesn't mess around, and he's out there. And by the way, if you, if you want to learn more about John the Baptist, PT preached a message a couple months ago called Rebel with a Cause. I would encourage you to go ahead and listen to that just to get caught up. But John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and he's preaching the word. And one day he is, he's preaching the word. It says this in verse 15. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater. Somebody say greater. Greater Greater than I am. So much greater. Somebody say greater. Greater. That I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. And then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chafe with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. So John the Baptist is out, and here's the thing. If John the Baptist didn't know who he was, if he wasn't secure in his identity as the one that was supposed to prepare the way for Jesus, it would have been really easy for him to clout check, to get caught up in the clout, right? It would have been really easy for him to go, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm like the Messiah. Like, I'm pretty awesome, And it would have been easy for him to like maybe get some extra followers, get some extra fame, put himself out there. But instead, John the Baptist is very secure in who he is. He knows who he is. He knows what he's supposed to do. And so he knows that he's preparing the way for Jesus. See, there's something beautiful. And when we know something beautiful about knowing our identity, which brings us to the passage today in John chapter three, verse 21. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. Man, there is so much beauty right here. Man, I don't want us to miss it. 
Like, it is easy to go, it's just two verses and I'm gonna move on. But man, Jesus in this moment gets baptized. In the other gospel accounts, it tells us a little bit more. In fact, when Jesus rolls up on the scene, John the Baptist says, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, it shouldn't be me that baptizes you. You should be baptizing me because he knows that Jesus is greater. And so in this moment, but Jesus says, no, I have to be baptized. Now, can we just pause real quick, right? Baptism as we know it, is an outward proclamation of an inward transformation, right? It's this moment where John the Baptist says, repent of your sins and be baptized, making an outward proclamation of the inward transformation. But here's the thing. Each and every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us needs to put our faith in Jesus. Each and every one of us gets to make that outward proclamation of the inward transformation that he's done But wait, Jesus was a perfect, sinless man. Why did he need to be baptized? I mean, is that a fair question? It would be a fair question. And so the people even might be like, why on earth did he did? Well, here's why. Because in baptism, according to Romans 6, right, it tells us that don't you know that those of you that have been baptized into Christ's death also were baptized into his resurrection? And so what that says right there is this. When we are baptized, we identify ourselves with Jesus. So when Jesus comes and gets baptized, he identifies himself with us. So Jesus is baptized, identifying himself with us so that when we are baptized, we can identify with him. So he takes on our brokenness, our sin on the cross, but even in baptism, he says, I'm gonna identify myself with you so that when you do this, you'll identify with me. That the same promises that come to Jesus will come to you. The same promises that, may, that, 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 that the Lord says about Jesus will come to you, will be filled through you, will lift you up right now. Come on, church. We are, okay. Okay, I did, I did this at nine, and I want, I, this isn't to shame or anything, but man, I just, I think sometimes we miss the opportunity to praise the Lord and to worship the Lord with all of our being. I, I, I've watched football games with some of you, and I see the way you cheer when Nebraska scores a touchdown. And if we're gonna cheer like that when an 18 year old kid catches a leather piece of leather football and scores a touchdown, how much more should we cheer and celebrate salvation and the goodness of God? Now, now listen, I, I don't want anyone to do something that they, that isn't who they are. I don't want any, I don't want to shame that this isn't me shaming right now. This isn't me trying to say, Hey, don't worship the way that the, the way that you're designed to some of us, man, we should worship right here. But I know that there are some of us that man worshiping here is where we should be because this is where we worship things of the world. How much more can we worship the, the King of the universe and God, our father. Sorry, but I just, man, there is, there is something about worshiping God with all of our, not just our mouth, but also with our body and our praise. And so Jesus rolls up on the scene and uh, there's also, okay, so I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta go. Cool, 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 cool. Man, I'm slow. All right. I don't want us to miss this. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly beloved son and you bring me great joy. Like at this moment, all three persons of the Godhead come together in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now there's this word that we use in the church, it's called the Trinity. Somebody say Trinity. Now I know the Trinity can be complicated and be very challenging. Here's the thing, even for the most, like we're gonna understand about 1% about the Trinity here on earth and then the other 99% in glory, okay? But I do wanna try to help us understand how unbelievably awesome this moment is and, and also help us understand the Trinity just for a second. But first I need to get a drink of water. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Okay, real quick, what am I drinking? Water, what is the chemical makeup of this? H2O, H2O. very good. Now, if I wanted to make my water cold, what would I put in it? Ice, what is the chemical makeup of ice? 
H2O. And if I were to put boiling, if I were to put water on a stovetop and put it on high, what starts to come off the water? What is the chemical makeup of steam? H2O. So if I'm clear, if I were to start a pan on my stovetop and I were to put a block of ice on it, in a matter of seconds, there would be a moment where there would be ice, water, and steam at the same time, yes? And all of those are H2O? One God, three persons. Oh, so that water is good. Okay, so there's this beautiful moment right now where the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all together. Man, woo wait, there is something special, but I don't want us to miss what, G, what, what is said by the Father, yeah. right? The Father says, this is my, I'm gonna use a different translation, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So I want you to think of this, say beloved, beloved. well pleased, beloved, beloved. well pleased. So in other words, what he's saying right here is that, man, Jesus, you are my beloved. I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you, and I'm pleased with you. Now, here's the thing. My middle daughter just got done qualifying for state track, and I was really excited about that, right? woo yeah. I mean, I was, I was down there, I was high-fiving her and everything, and I was telling her how proud I was of, it, of her. And so it would have been really easy for her to know, man, my dad is well-pleased with me right now because of what I did. See, this is why we believe so often that our identity is in what we do because everything that we get is from is accolades based off of, oh, you did good, I'm pleased. You did good, here's a raise. You did good, here's a promotion. You did good, here's my love, right? But the reality is, is that God says that's the opposite of what I, how I love you. Look at what he did right here. He says to Jesus, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. At this point, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. This starts Jesus' ministry. This is the very beginning. And so here's the thing. What God says is, Jesus, you're my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That's who you are. That's your identity. Now go out of that. It's not do and receive. It's receive and then go and do. See, there, there is somebody in the house of God today that just has been feeling for so long, man, I am everything that I do. I have to do the right thing. I have to be the right person. I have to get this promotion. I have to make this kind of money. I have to live in this house. If I just do all of these things, God will be pleased with me. But here's the thing. God is pleased with you because he created you, because he loves you, because he knows you, because he wants to be with you. He wants to work through you. He wants his power to radiate through you. He wants to do immeasurably more than you can ask, think, or imagine. Church, it isn't about what you do. You are not a collection of all of the past mistakes that you've made. I don't care where you're at in life right now. You are free in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, whew, yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna go right now. Can, can I just, can I tell you what the Bible says about you if you are in Christ? Because again, remember this, like if you are in Christ, if you said, if you professed your faith in Jesus Christ and you are in Christ, right? Here's what the Bible says who you are. In Christ, you are God's child. In Christ, you are his disciple and his friend. In Christ, you have been justified. In Christ, you are united with the Lord and you are one with him in spirit. In Christ, you have been brought with a price. You belong to God. In Christ, you are a member of Christ's body. In Christ, you have been chosen, adopted, anointed, appointed, redeemed, forgiven at his child. In Christ, you have been redeemed and forgiven of your sins. In Christ, you are made complete. In Christ, you are assured that God will work all goods for you in, in all circumstances. In Christ, you have, whew, like, in Christ, man, I got lightheaded. In Christ, you are free from any condemnation brought against you, and you cannot be separated from the love of God. In Christ, you have been established, seated, and sealed by God. In Christ, you are confident that he will complete a good work that he started in you. In Christ, you are a citizen of heaven. In Christ, you have been not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. In Christ, you are born of God. The evil one cannot touch you. In Christ, you are a branch of Jesus.
Jesus Christ, the true vine, a channel of his life. In Christ you have been chosen, appointed. You are God's temple. You are a minister of reconciliation. You are seated with Jesus Christ. You are his workmanship. You can approach him with freedom and confidence and you can do all things through Christ who strengthened you. That's who you are in Christ. And it is not because of what you've done. It is because of what he has done and now will do through you. You are beloved and you are, and he is well pleased by you. But I know that some of you are like, cool, 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 all right. Cool, the emotions got me up, I got fired up there. But it's still me saying it, right? And sometimes who says it matters as much as what was said. See, middle school kids, they listen to their parents all day long. Man, parents, some of you parents in the room right now, you're like, man, I feel like my kid does not listen to me at all. They're listening to you. They hear you. And if we continue to train them up over and over and over, if you train up a child to know the Lord, the truth will never depart from them. Parents, there will come a time though when your words, your teachings, your trainings become like white noise and they'll start looking for other voices in their life to either confirm or to disprove what it is that you've said about them. And suddenly other people's words start to carry more weight. Their friends' words start to carry more weight. Their coaches' words, their teachers' words, even their enemies' words start to carry more weight than yours. Parents, don't give up. Continue to pour in, continue to love. No matter how grown they are, they'll always be your children. But I'll tell you, I'll say it this way. If I go to Target right now and a guy just walks up to me, a completely random stranger walks up to me and he goes, hey, you're a good dad. And you know what? Also, you have a lot of energy. You seem like a real like fun guy. I also have watched you go through there. You're an incredibly generous person who loves really well. Man, there is something special about you. Just wanted you to know. I'm gonna be like, thanks. But you don't know me. But if my grandpa, who lived next door to, uh, to me and spoke life into me on a regular basis comes up to me and he says, Ben, you're a good dad. Man, I love the way that you love people and you're so full of joy. Always walk into that. And you're generous and the love of Jesus works through you. It just hits me different. And so I think that there are some of us in here that, man, we can hear what the Bible says about us, but because we don't know who says it, it doesn't carry quite the weight. So I wanna tell you who it is that says all of these things about you in the word, and that's God the Father. See, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them, including each and every one of us. He gives us life, he gives us breath. He gives us every gift and good thing that we have. God is infinite and incomparable. He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He exists everywhere, he knows everything, and he has all power and authority. And this God who is over all things, who could be outside of, the universe, outside of all of his creation, instead he is just, loving, truthful, and holy. And he shows compassion, mercy, and grace. He judges sin, but he also offers forgiveness to anyone who will call on his name. Not only, does he create, did, not only did he create the world, but he also sustains the world and he is executing his eternal plan every single day, which by the way, involves the redemption of man from the, from the curse of sin and death through his son, Jesus Christ. He disciplines his children. He'll judge the world. But most importantly, 
He loves you. See, everything that he wrote in the word, every, everything that was inspired by the Holy Spirit for each and every one of us was written by the one who created it all, started it all, sustained it all, and he wants to pour out into you. So there is weight behind who says these things. When it says that you're forgiven, there is weight behind it because he's the only one that can forgive. When he says that he sets you free, that there's weight behind that because he's the only one that can set you free. You see, so often we get so afraid of what people around us are gonna say. There's more weight to the words of the people around us than there is to God. Man, we should be seeking the approval of God over this approval of man. Because of what he says, listen, listen to me. There are some of you that seriously, you are stuck in this trapment of sin in your past. You look at your life, you're like, who am I? I don't like who I am. I'm hopeless, I'm broken, I'm hurting, I'm a mess. Man, there's no way that anyone could ever love me. And the truth of the matter is, he loves you. He's for you. See, all of the promises of God come before anything that you've done. And by the way, if you've already done the things, he's like, today you can be made new. Kevin, where, Kevin's not here. Man, I need Kevin to be shouting right now. You can be made new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Not because of what you've done or what you're gonna do, but because of who he is. And here's the best part. He says, this is my beloved son or daughter with whom I'm well pleased. And then when we die, we'll stand before him in glory and he'll look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I wanna live a life between the well pleased and the well done. And so Father God, Lord, we praise you for who you are we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you for all the ways that you've loved us, the gifts, the talents, the abilities, for the times that you've stood with us in the, in the trials and in the temptations, in the battles and in the muck. And Lord, we praise you for coming on a rescue mission for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray today that you would move in hearts that you would, you would break the chains of feeling like we have to do, but instead that we would lean into you and trust you and receive what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And before I say amen, I'm gonna invite everyone to stand. And the thing is, is that there are, there are, I believe that there are people in this room today that this is new, that you may not have heard even about this Jesus. Maybe you were invited by a friend. Maybe you came in because you were struggling this week. You've been in, a, in the fight. You've been in a battle. And I, here's the thing. I want you to know that each and every one of you was created in the image of God. We were made in his image. And in the beginning, everything was good. But there was a tree and that tree was the knowledge of good and evil. And because Adam and Eve was told not to do it and then they decided to do it, the knowledge of evil came into the world. And what it did was it separated us from God, knowing both good and evil. We decided that we wanted to be God ourselves. And every time we pursue being a, our little G gods, what happens is it separates us further. It's called sin. Sin is doing anything that is outside the will of God. And so what ended up happening was, was sin entered into the world and each and every one of us ever since have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And here's the thing, the wages of sin are death. And so left in our own, uh, in our own power, in our own will, we would be headed straight for death. But God, who was rich in mercy, decided that he wanted to love us so well that he sent his son Jesus to leave heaven, to descend to earth, to live a perfect sinless life, a life that was marked by love. And the thing is, is that the more that Jesus poured out his love, the more that he loved people, the more they hated him because he was pointed always towards the Father and they always were pointed in towards themselves because we're all sinners. And so what they did was they took their hatred, their pride, their arrogance towards him and they put him to death on a cross. 
because they didn't want him to be the God of their lives. They didn't want him to be their savior or their king. Instead, they wanted to be the savior and king of their own life. And so they took him to death. They put him on a cross and they crucified him. But what they didn't realize is that they thought that they were stopping Jesus, but they were just getting him started. Because on that cross, all of our sin went upon him. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And all of his righteousness came out to us when he said, it is finished. And so then it says that he breathes his last. And it might've been our sin that put him on the cross, but it was his love that held him there. And then he went into a grave and on the third day he rose up from the grave. See, he conquered sin on the cross, but he conquered death in the grave because what he wanted was he wanted us to be with him forever and ever and ever. And not only did he want us to be with him forever, but he ascended back into heaven to be at the right hand of God, sending Holy Spirit to earth so that it could move from God with us to God in us. And we can now go with the power of the Holy Spirit out into the world, being his example, his love, and going with his authority because we've identified ourselves with him as the beloved. And maybe you've never heard that before today. And today's the day that, man, you need to make the decision to follow him. You're like, man, I just wanna follow him with my life. No longer, no longer putting my hope in what I can do. No longer putting my identity in what I can do or what I've done. But instead, I wanna put my identity in who he says that I am. I wanna be the beloved. I wanna be well pleased and I wanna be well done. And so in this moment, in this place, church, will you pray for the people in this room? But if that's you, who says, yes, I wanna profess Jesus as my savior. I'm gonna invite you to come right down front here. I'm gonna say a prayer with you. We're gonna lead you in a prayer and may you be forever changed. So church pray and everybody else come on down. coming forward today to, to make this decision. And maybe you're watching online right now and you've made the decision right there. If you would, just put in the comments below, I've decided to say yes to Jesus. But I wanna lead you in a prayer, whether you're online or right here. Church, will you extend an arm? H hang on. Man, there is somebody in here And man, you are, you feel hopeless. You feel ashamed. I, I, I'll even go so far as I, you know the truth, yet you don't think that it'll set you free. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait 10 more seconds because I believe you're in here. And I wanna, if that's you, no matter where you're at, wait no longer. Today's the day. He loves you. He's for you. He knows you and he sees you. Repeat after me. Say, God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for creating me in your image. I'm a sinner. Forgive me for my sins. Make me anew. Jesus, will you be my king, my savior, and will you lead me every day? Use me for your glory and to help a ton of people.
In Jesus' name, amen.